that I think uh, many of you have heard before. Um, so welcome to the uh, EPL thematic seminar series uh, focused on uh, volcanism and magmatism. Um, so this is our, our second uh, talk and you can find the early one, earlier ones recorded. Um, so just a reminder that we'll take a break next week um, for Thanksgiving, but we have one more talk in this series from Verity Flower uh, that'll be two weeks from today. So please, uh, please uh, come and attend that one and um, get, get, collect the, the whole set of uh, volcanology talks. Um, so also a reminder to the postdocs, um, right after the talk, there's gonna be uh, an open discussion. Um, you can talk science, you can talk life. Um, Michelle is um, happy to chat with you. Um, so please uh, stick around on this Zoom right afterwards. Um, so a reminder to everybody to please um, mute yourself during the talk and um, try to keep all of the questions until the end. So. Um, it, you can put a question in the chat box at any time um, and I can start out by reading those and then we'll just do uh, raised hands at the end. Um, so the standard format. Um, and I think that's everything on the logistical front. Um, so with that, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Michelle Muth. Um, so I met Michelle a little while ago when she was uh, at the Smithsonian working with Liz Cottrell and um, she came and stopped by campus uh, and we got a, a bit of a chance to chat. Um, and I looked up her work and sounded very exciting. Um, so uh, we're very happy to have her here. Um, so Michelle uh, has her bachelor's degree in science from Rice University, uh, where she did uh, some work uh, on her thesis with Raj Dasgupta looking at uh, CO2 solubility. Um, and as we all know, um, sulfur is the new carbon. So she uh, then moved to the University of Oregon, go Ducks, and uh, is a PhD candidate in Paul Wallace's lab, uh, where her research is now focused on uh, sulfur solubility and, and sulfate species in magmas. And so today, uh, we're going to hear from her about petrology, sulfur cycling, and implications for magma evolution. And with that, Michelle, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. And I'm super excited to share some of the work I've been thinking about over the last few years. So I will go ahead and share my screen. All right. Can everyone see that? Cool. All right, so uh, what I've been spending a lot of time thinking about over the last few years is uh, sulfur cycling in subduction zones, and more specifically, the close tie between um, sulfur cycling in arcs and the oxidation state of arc magmas. So I'll talk a little bit about the motivation for this work. Um, many of you may be familiar with this picture. This was taken shortly before the um, climactic eruption of Pinatubo in 1991. And Pinatubo was a very um, important eruption for many reasons in furthering our understanding of uh, how volcanoes operate. It was one of the largest eruptions of the century. And it was also one of the first times that we were able to make some really high precision measurements of sulfur outgassing at a volcano. And so being able to combine these really high quality measurements of sulfur in uh, volcanic gases with observations about the eruption really allowed us to further understanding of um, how sulfur behaves in volcanic systems and the effect of sulfur on things like global climate and the local environment. But what I find uh, most fascinating about Pinatubo is that it's part of this larger view of global sulfur cycling. So to illustrate this, um, I put here a really uh, beautiful schematic by Allison Shaw and Nicole Keller at Woods Hole. And I really like it because it does a great job of laying out where sulfur resides in a bunch of different reservoirs within our earth. So sulfur is present in our atmosphere. It's present as uh, predominantly sulfate in our oceans. It's also present in our crust and the mantle. And within this broader view of how sulfur moves through all these different reservoirs, um, I'm specifically interested in what's happening at subduction zones, so that kind of middle portion of the figure. And the reason why understanding sulfur at subduction zones is so important is for a few reasons. Um, one I already touched on, which is that 
Sulfur degassing at arc volcanoes um, can drive uh, periods of short-term global cooling. It can potentially have a huge impact on global climate. Um, and it's also a, a really key way that we understand volcanic hazards and monitor volcanoes. If we go a little bit deeper, we can think about the behavior of sulfur in the Earth's crust and the behavior of sulfur in magmas and how sulfur moves through the Earth's crust as uh, magmas ascend into volcanic systems has huge implications for the transport and the storage of ore forming metals. So when we think, think about things like porphyry copper deposits, molybdenum, molybdenum deposits, and things like that, uh, those are super dependent on how sulfur is behaving in arc systems. And so a lot of the motivation for my research is to say, okay, we know that sulfur is very important in these more shallow processes. Um, how does slab derived sulfur drive uh, what we see at the surface? And what's the effect of slab derived materials um, in creating the sulfur contents that we see um, at the surface today? The reason why uh, I'd also like to understand oxidation state uh, along with this view of global sulfur cycling is that the behavior of sulfur is uh, extremely closely linked to magma oxidation state. And so what I'm showing here is a experimental calibration of sulfur speciation as a function of magma oxidation state. And uh, for those of you who haven't thought about magma oxidation state for a while, uh, what I'm doing here is expressing oxidation state as oxygen fugacity relative to the QFM buffer. And all you really need to know for the purposes of this talk is that more oxidized magmas plot to the right of this plot, so higher values of delta QFM, and more reducing conditions plot to the left of this plot, so lower values of delta QFM. And so what you're seeing in this curve is the transition um, between the two dominant uh, species of sulfur and silicate melts, and that's sulfide or S2 minus at more reducing conditions and sulfate or S6 plus at more oxidizing conditions. And so you can see that uh, at conditions about QFM plus zero or below, silicate melts are completely dominated in sulfide and there's almost no sulfate in them. And then in more oxidizing conditions at about uh, QFM plus two or above, uh, silicate melts are almost completely dominated by sulfate. But what I find especially uh, fascinating about this plot and the reason why it's so interesting is that there's also this transition zone um, from about QFM plus zero to QFM plus two, where sulfur is actually present in some proportion of both of these two chemical species. These two chemical species are uh, very different. And so that means that the transition from a sulfide dominated silicate melt to a sulfate dominated silicate melt uh, has large implications for the overall behavior of sulfur in a volcanic system. And one really important implication is the effective uh, solubility of sulfur in a silicate melt. So sulfur is a, it's a pretty fascinating element. And part of the reason why it's so interesting is that in addition to partitioning into a vapor phase uh, in volcanic eruptions and in magma storage, uh, sulfur also forms these emissible sulfide phases. And I'm showing two examples of that on the left-hand portion of this slide. So at the top, um, I'm showing a emissible sulfide liquid that was found in a mid-ocean ridge basalt glass, and these aren't uncommon to see at all. And uh, I find them pretty beautiful. Uh, the technical term for these is sulfide blubs, and you can see they're pretty small, and they're dominantly composed of uh, sulfide, so ST minus, uh, iron, and a little bit of copper and nickel. And I, I especially like this photo because you can still see a small fleck um, of volcanic glass clinging to that, to that sulfide lead. So it's not uncommon to see them in magmas. And uh, it's also important to note that these emissible sulfide phases are present in the Earth's mantle. So to illustrate that, I'm showing a uh, zoom mantle peridotite xenolith on the bottom left. And you can see that that also hosts an emissible sulfide phase within it. So basically what happens is once a silicate melt is saturated in one of these sulfide phases, um, that effectively caps how much sulfur the melt can hold. So you can think of this as basically the effect of sulfur solubility. And what I'm showing on the plot to the right is a uh, model of uh, that effective sulfur solubility. Um, it's sometimes referred to as the sulfur content at sulfide saturation plotted as a function of oxygen fugacity. 
And uh, what you'll notice if you look in detail at the plot is right around QFM plus zero or so, so right around that transition from a sulfide dominated silicate melt to a sulfate dominated silicate melt, there's an enormous increase in how much sulfur the melt can hold. And it's not until you reach pretty oxidizing conditions uh, around QFM plus two or so that the amount of sulfur the melt can hold is instead capped um, by saturation in a sulfate rich phase, um, and that's usually in hydrate. So that's one reason why understanding sulfur speciation in silicate melts is so important if we want to understand what sulfur is doing. Oops, sorry about that. So the reason why understanding sulfur speciation um, is especially important in uh, subduction zones and arc magmas is that the oxygen fugacity of arc magmas and estimates of oxygen fugacity for the mantle wedge straddle that transition from sulfide to sulfate almost exactly. And so to illustrate this, I'm showing the same experimental calibration that I showed um, in the last two slides, but uh, this time I've overlain the author's estimates for the oxidation state of each of these reservoirs. And so you can see that mid-ocean ridge basalts, um, they're pretty reduced and they're dominantly uh, sulfide rich. There's not much sulfate in them, uh, but that estimates for the mantle wedge and estimates for island arc basalts really do straddle this uh, transition almost completely from sulfide uh, to sulfate. And uh, this makes things really interesting because it means that uh, small changes in oxygen fugacity within arc magmas have enormous implications uh, for the uh, behavior of sulfur. And I'll also add that conversely, if you add a bunch of this uh, oxidized sulfate into a magma, it can really change the oxidation state over the overall system. And so understanding this, uh, this interplay between sulfur speciation and magma oxidation state is extremely important in subduction zones. So as fascinating as this all is, um, it actually also presents an additional challenge. Um, and that's that although the observation has been made for a long time uh, that arc magmas are relative to mid-ocean rich basalts, um, the causes behind that are actually still somewhat debated. Um, and so there's kind of two end member conceptual models as to what could cause arc magmas to uh, become more oxidized. One is that uh, arc magmas don't actually start out their lives inherently uh, more oxidized than mid-ocean rich basalts. And that instead it's processes that happen um, during crustal storage. So things like crystallization, degassing, uh, magma recharge, stuff like that, that drives these arc magmas towards more oxidized uh, conditions. The other conceptual model is that uh, arc magmas are oxidized because they've been influenced by slab drive material. So we, we all learn in our intro geology classes that arc magmas are influenced by uh, water from the subducting slab and that that subducting, uh, that slab drive fluid also contains other trace elements um, and that arc magmas are then uh, enriched in those elements. And so in this conceptual model, um, there would be enough oxidizing slab drive material that the arc magmas produced in the subarc mantle wedge are also themselves oxidized. And for the purposes of this project, I would really like to understand the second conceptual model, um, the potential impact of oxidizing slab drive material through the lens of sulfur cycling and thinking really carefully about this relationship. So to think about this more in detail, I'm going to use Lassen Volcanic Field and the Southern Cascades as kind of a natural laboratory. And I'm gonna conduct a very detailed uh, case study of sulfur cycling at Lassen and its close tie to magma oxidation state. The reason I'm using Lassen is for uh, two main reasons. Uh, so one is that the Cascade Arc is what's known as a warm end member subduction zone. And what that means is that the subducting plate beneath the cascade, excuse me, the subducting plate beneath the cascades is really young and hot. And that has implications for the thermal structure of the subduction zone and has implications for the temperature of the slab during plate dehydration. So it's a really good point of comparison to other subduction zones where people have thought a lot about arc magma oxidation state like the Marianas, which is a cold end member subduction zone. So that works really well for what we wanna do. Um, another reason why I'm using Lassen 
is that there's a really well-established uh, petrologic framework there that we can take advantage of for this study. So a few years ago, uh, Christina Wolowski was able to use a combination of uh, geodynamic and geochemical modeling to make a really strong case for the influence of a hydrous slab drive melt uh, influencing the subarctic mantle of Lassen. And I've laid out that conceptual model in the uh, schematic figure to the right here. So in this framework that we'll be using, uh, the subducting plate experiences slab bending outboard of the subduction zone, and that allows seawater to penetrate down past the oceanic crust into the underlying lithospheric mantle and creates this thin layer of hydrated lithospheric mantle. As the plate subducts, um, that hydrated lithospheric mantle starts to dehydrate, and those fluids rise into the overlying uh, altered oceanic crust, create a partial melt, and it's actually that hydrous um, silicic slab drive melt that then rises into the subarctic mantle and participates in magma petrogenesis. So uh, this is really viable because it means that we have a really nice framework laid out and we can just focus in on what sulfur and uh, what sulfur is doing at Lassen and the close tie between sulfur content and oxidation state. So the first question to ask is just about characterization. If we wanna investigate sulfur cycling at Lassen, the, step, the first step is just to think about uh, what the sulfur content of Lassen magmas are. To do this, uh, we're going to use cinder cones from Lassen Volcanic Field. So I'm showing an example of a cinder cone here and um, they're really uh, fun, simple features. Uh, you can see here that this uh, vol volcano is essentially just a big pile of tephra with a lava flow next to it. So they're, they're really simple features. Um, they don't have the same complicated plumbing system that larger strata volcanoes do, of, although of course there is some kind of uh, crustal storage system there. Um, but what studying these simple uh, cinder cones allows us to do is to isolate uh, the, mantle signal, the mantle signal to the extent we're able to and minimize the effects of crustal storage and differentiation. So to collect the samples that we used for the study, we hiked around to deposits from a bunch of different cinder cones at Lassen, and we collected olivine hosted melt inclusions from the volcanic tephra. The reason why these melt inclusions are extremely useful for studying sulfur is that they kind of act as tiny pressure vessels. And so what I mean by that is that the way these melt inclusions form is that uh, during magma storage, as things start to crystallize, a uh, forming crystal will, will essentially trap a small parcel of silicate melt. And once that parcel of silicate melt is trapped within that host crystal, the host crystal acts as a tiny pressure vessel and keeps elements like water, uh, sulfur, and chlorine that would otherwise uh, partition into a vapor phase during eruption uh, trapped within that crystal host. And so if you want to understand what sulfur is doing and how it relates to other volatile elements at Lassen, uh, these mount inclusions are the best way to do that. So as I said, we hiked around to six different cinder cones at Lassen and collected um, olivine hosted mount inclusions from each of them. So you're seeing the results of that work here. Uh, each panel represents one uh, cinder cone at Lassen. So Borg, BBL, BRM, these are all different cinder cones at Lassen. And then within the plot, each uh, smaller symbol represents one uh, analyzed melt inclusion. And the larger symbol in each plot represents the uh, primary magma that we've calculated for each cinder cone. And what I mean by the primary magma is essentially it's the magma that emerges from mantle melting processes before they undergo any kind of crystallization or degassing. So you can imagine them as these very fresh uh, mantle melts. And if we just take a look at the, uh, the sulfur contents that are calculated uh, for primary magma compositions based on our melt inclusion analyses, we start to see that uh, there's variations in sulfur contents within each cinder cone. So using the two extreme cases as an example, we see that uh, in cinder cone BBL, the sulfur contents are uh, pretty indistinguishable from MORV. And I should note that I've plotted uh, the sulfur contents of mid-ocean rich basalts here in the gray field. So we see that BBL is uh, pretty indistinguishable from more than its sulfur contents and uh, overall fairly low sulfur contents around 1000 ppm or so. Uh, but then in contrast, we have cinder cones like BRM 
through BRBB, uh, to some extent Borg, all of these cinder cones uh, have clear elevations uh, in sulfur contents relative to mid-ocean rich basalts. So if we're looking at this plot and we're thinking about uh, sulfur cycling and subduction zones and slab-derived sulfur, uh, the, the natural question to ask is whether or not slab-derived sulfur is causing these differences. And so to test that idea, we are going to use trace element systematics. And I'll note before I dive into this plot that from now um, and for the rest of the talk, every time you see these uh, symbols, they represent the primary magmas for each cinder cone. So we went and analyzed trace elements in the same set of mount inclusions and used them to calculate uh, last and primary magma compositions. So I'll break down this plot a little bit. On the x-axis, um, I'm using strontium over neodymium as a proxy for the amount of slab drag material in the mantle wedge. And the reason I chose these two elements is that strontium partitions uh, preferentially into slab drive melts relative to neodymium. Uh, but then during the uh, process of mantle melting and the early stages of crystallization, uh, the two elements behave relatively similarly. And so what that means is that any elevations in strontium relative to neodymium is an indication that you've added more and more uh, slab drive melts into the subarc mantle. So that's the x-axis, and you can see I put an arrow there uh, just to remind us all that this is the direction of more slab drive material. And then on the y-axis, I've used sulfur over dispersium, and that was chosen with a similar logic in mind. So sulfur uh, partitions into a slab melt relative, uh, preferentially relative to dispersium. And so that means if we're seeing elevations in sulfur relative to dispersium, it can be an indication that we've added more and more sulfur into the subarc mantle. So if we compare these two ratios and we see a correlation between sulfur dispersium and strontium to neodymium, um, it's an indication that uh, we're seeing the influence of a sulfur rich uh, slab drive material uh, influencing the sulfur content that we see at the surface at Lassen. This uh, sulfur rich slab drive material and the correlations that we see between sulfur dispersium and strontium over neodymium is really similar to what we see for other volatile elements. So I'm showing uh, plots uh, with a similar logic made for water and for chlorine, and you can see that they all show a similar correlation. And so if we take all these things together, what we're seeing is a really consistent picture of a uh, sulfur-rich, uh, water-rich, and chlorine-rich slab-derived component variably influencing the subarc mantle source for each of these different cinder cones. So this is fantastic. Uh, we've gotten a handle on the sulfur contents for magmas at Lassen, and we've been able to uh, find indicators that these variations in sulfur contents are being driven by slab-derived materials. And so the next logical thing to ask is, what does this uh, slab-derived sulfur look like? And so can we trace it back to its source in the slab? And can we get a handle on what the sulfur speciation of that slab-derived melt might look like? To do this, I'm going to take advantage of sulfur isotopes and the ratio of 34S to 32S. And so what I'm showing here is a schematic map showing uh, sulfur isotopes in all the different reservoirs uh, within subduction zones. And specifically what I'd like to draw your eye to are two different reservoirs. Um, one is the depleted mantle. The exact value of uh, sulfur isotopes in the depleted mantle and in mid-ocean ridge basalt is somewhat debated, um, but I think everyone agrees that it's somewhere around zero per mil or so. And in contrast, uh, the sulfur, isotope, uh, sulfur isotopic composition of seawater is consistently heavy uh, and is around 21 per mil. The reason why it's important to keep track of these two reservoirs is that uh, both of them play a role in influencing the sulfur isotopic composition of the downgoing plate. So essentially what happens is that the mid-ocean ridge basalt forms and it um, inherits the same sulfur isotope signature that the depleted mantle has, so somewhere around zero per mil. But then during the process of hydrothermal alteration, um, it's affected by the seawater sulfate. And the seawater sulfate can either precipitate directly within the crust as in hydrate, um, but can also uh, alter the sulfide phases from the primary mid-ocean ridge basalt uh, 
and influence uh, the sol overall sulfur isotope budget in that way. The other stage that seawater interacts with um, the overall sulfur isotopic composition of the downgoing plate is this process of outboard slab bending and lithospheric hydration. So during the process of slab bending, um, seawater percolates down past the altered oceanic crust into a small portion of the lithospheric mantle beneath, and that seawater sulfate can become incorporated into the mantle as the mantle serpentinizes. And so in that stage two, um, we're seeing the direct influence of this isotopically heavy seawater sulfate in the downgoing plate. So what I'd like to do at Lassen is to check and see if we can find the signature of the seawater sulfate in Lassen magmas. To do this, we brought the same set of melt inclusions uh, that we used to measure major elements and trace elements. We brought them over to the SIMS facility and measured sulfur isotopes directly within the inclusion. So what you're seeing here is uh, primary magma compositions for each cinder cone uh, calculated using the average composition of measured uh, sulfur isotopes within each melt inclusion data set. And again, for reference, I put uh, the sulfur isotopic composition of mid-ocean rich basalts um, in that gray density contour for comparison. What's extremely exciting about this plot uh, is two things. Um, one is that we do see a very clear, uh, consistent, um, heavy sulfur isotope signature in all of the magmas at Lassen. So all of them have higher values delta 34s relative to mid-ocean rich basalts, which is an indication that we might be seeing the influence of seawater uh, derived sulfate. But what's especially exciting about this plot is actually that we see this nice, um, relatively clear correlation between sulfur isotopes and strontium to neodymium, which we're using as our proxy for slab drive material. And so what's so nice about this is that we're able to say more definitively that the sulfur isotope variations that we're seeing are tracking the influence of slab drive sulfur at Lassen. So I think this is a huge step forward. Um, we've been able to use sulfur isotopes to um, get a feel for what the sulfur, uh, slab dry sulfur looks like. And we're able to see that it's most likely uh, seawater derived sulfate. And so the next logical step to ask then is what is the effect of slab derived sulfate on the oxidation state of arc magmas? So can this uh, S6 plus dominated silicate melt um, significantly affect the overall oxidation state of magmas that form in the mantle wedge. So to do this, uh, we're going to look at the final data set that we collected on these melt inclusions, and that's uh, a Zanes data set. So Zanes is a technique that's extremely useful for studying the oxidation state of melt inclusions because it allows you to estimate the relative proportion of ferric and ferrous iron and of sulfate and sulfide directly within um, mount inclusions themselves. And so what you're seeing on these two plots is the results of those Zanes analyses. On the left-hand plot, I plotted uh, oxy oxygen fugacity, again, relative to this QFM buffer. And this is calculated with our iron Zanes data, so the proportion of ferric to ferrous iron. And on the right-hand plot, I've put uh, our sulfur speciation uh, calculated from our sulfur Zanes data. And again, I've put uh, the mid-ocean ridge basalt field in the gray density contours for comparison. And what we're seeing here is really consistent what with, with what we've been seeing for the rest of the talk, which is that there's a really clear correlation um, between oxidation state and the proxy for slab drive material that we're using, strontium over neodymium. And so this is really exciting. Um, it suggests that uh, slab drive sulfur is in some way linked to the overall oxidation state of arc magmas. And so, uh, you know, we're seeing these correlations um, between arc magma oxidation state and the amount of slab drive material in them. Um, and we know also that slab drive sulfur is being added to the subarc mantle when it's likely present as sulfate. But um, we all learn, you know, that correlation does not mean causation. So what I'd like to do for the remainder of the talk is walk through a couple of different melt mantle melting models that I developed to uh, test this idea with all of the rigor um, and consideration that it deserves. So I'll walk through the overall conceptual model um, that we're going to be using for our calculations here. 
So the basic question that we want to answer with this model is what happens when a sulfate dominated hydrous silicic milk rises and reacts with the mantle wedge? So uh, we're going to do that by approximating the process of reactive um, transport in the mantle wedge. And I've adapted a figure from uh, one of Christy Tell's papers to, to just get a feel for this, right? So we have uh, melting shortly above the slab, uh, slab mantle interface that um, silicics hydrous slab drive melt rises up into the mantle wedge, starts to react with the mantle peridotite until it reaches this hot core of the mantle wedge. And so to approximate this process uh, with our calculations, what I'm going to do is in our first model step, um, take a silicic uh, hydrous slab drive melt and equilibrate it with a mantle prototype at a specified uh, melt wrap ratio. After that uh, slab melt and the mantle prototype equilibrates, we now have a newly equilibrated uh, silicate melt that is some mixture of the original slab melt and the newly formed uh, mental peridotite partial melt. And so I'll take that newly equilibrated melt and I'll uh, place it at a more shallow depth and re-equilibrate that uh, new silicate melt with fresh mental peridotite at the same melt rock ratio. And then once I do that, I'll repeat step two along a specified pressure temperature path that's meant to recreate the rise of a, of a partial melt through the inverted thermal grating of the mantle wedge. And so what I mean by that is that in the mantle wedge uh, for the forced portion of uh, the rise of melt, you're actually going to, going to higher temperatures as you go to lower pressures. So that's the conceptual framework that we're using. And now I'll just uh, step through a short summary of the calculations that go into the model. To calculate phase equilibria at each of these equilibration steps, I'm using PMELT's thermodynamic models. And uh, I'm showing the summary of model outputs here. So just to walk through this plot a little bit, each uh, gray line on this plot represents one model run. So uh, going from 2.1 GPA, stepping up to 1.2 GPA. Um, and then uh, for, for reference, I've highlighted the peak mantle temperature step uh, in these gray dots. So each gray dot, or excuse me, each green dot uh, represents the silicate melt composition output from our model at the peak temperature step of the model. And so it's that composition uh, that we're using for comparison uh, to what we see at the surface. And so if we look at these figures, um, I've plotted for comparison the primary magmas calculated for each Sinderquinet lesson. And we can see that overall, we get a pretty good fit between our PMELTS models and the major elements of the, uh, of the magma compositions that we're, that we're seeing at the service. Um, I'll also note that we ran the model at a range of melt rock ratios. So that's what you're seeing in this gradation from light green to dark green uh, dots. So light green represents low melt rock ratios and dark green represents high melt rock ratios. So that's uh, the calculations that we use to calculate the phase equilibria and the major element composition of the melt at each step. But we want to track uh, what the electron budget is doing so that we can get a handle on how this slab drive sulfate is affecting the overall oxidation state of magmas. And so to do that, I'm going to uh, add in a calculation for sulfur iron redox balance. And we're going to use that to track uh, the magma electron budget at each melt step. I am uh, showing the electron balance model that I'm using here, excuse me, the sulfur iron redox balance model that I'm using here. You can see that it looks a lot like the sulfur speciation model that I showed towards the beginning of the talk. Um, but in this case, I'm plotting it as a function of ferric iron content, uh, not oxygen fugacity. So essentially all this calculation is doing is tracking the relative proportion of uh, sulfur speciation, iron speciation um, as the melt evolves. This relationship is um, sensitive to pressure, uh, temperature, and composition in ways that are still a little bit uncertain. And so to make sure that the calculations that I'm doing are relevant to Lassen, I've made sure that the model that we use is consistent with our melt inclusion data. So that's shown in these small symbols in this plot here, and also with uh, measurements of sulfur speciation and iron speciation in mid-ocean ridge basalts. And so we can see that overall, we're getting a pretty good agreement between the uh, sulfur iron redox 
uh, balance calculation that we're doing and the natural melt compositions that we're seeing at Lassen. All right, so we have our model framework and we <clears throat> step through the calculations that are being used in the model. So now we'll step through a few different uh, model outputs. Sorry. Okay, so we'll start out with a what I'm calling our normal mantle melting case. And that's when we have uh, kind of a more absorbed mantle. So um, basing the ferric iron content of the mantle prototype and the sulfur content of the initial mantle prototype based on a more absorbed mantle. And I'm adding into it uh, a hydrous slab dried melt with a sulfate content that's based on um, the limited experimental data that's available. So if we do this, um, we can calculate again a range of models using different melt rack ratios. And this is meant to simulate the range of uh, influence of slab drive materials in the mantle source for each cinder cone. And there's two important observations here. Um, one is that slab drive sulfate does seem to have a clear uh, influence on the overall oxidation state of magmas. However, um, if we look in detail, we can see that this model doesn't reproduce uh, primary magma compositions at Lassen. And so in the lower right-hand plot, I've put uh, sulfur dispersing values, and you can see that uh, this model clearly underestimates the amount of sulfur in Lassen magmas. And then the top uh, left and right-hand panels, I put in uh, comparisons to the uh, overall uh, oxidation state of the magmas as calculated with our iron zines data and uh, comparisons to our sulfur speciation data. And you can see that here too, um, even though slab drive sulfate is having an effect on arc magma oxidation state, uh, it's really uh, not able to reproduce the most oxidized cinder cones. I'll also add for the, these models that I'm treating the sulfur isotope composition as an open parameter. And so I'm basically fitting um, the sulfur isotope composition of a slab drive melt in order to reproduce the, the compositions that we see at the surface. Okay. So the next question to ask is, okay, well, maybe we uh, weren't assuming that we had enough slab drive sulfur in our silicate melt and, or excuse me, in our slab drive melt. And so in order to investigate that in more detail, um, we've just ramped up the amount of sulfate in the slab drive melt all the way up to 10,000 ppm. So that's one weight percent, that's a lot of sulfate. And if we do that, uh, we see that two things happen. Uh, one is that we are able to reproduce some of the most oxidized uh, cinder cones at Lassen. Um, and with the exception of BRM, that uh, yellow diamond, uh, this, this model is able to do a decent job of estimating the magma oxidation state. However, uh, if you look at the lower right-hand panel, um, you can see that this model uh, vastly overshoots the magma compositions at Lassen, or excuse me, the sulfur contents of magmas at Lassen. And so the sulfur dispersion values um, aren't realistic at all. So we can look at this and say, okay, so maybe high slab sulfur is the key to understanding the system, but clearly there's something else that we're missing. Uh, one other consideration that we can add into these models is the effect of sulfide saturation that I talked about briefly in the beginning of the talk. So if we assume that uh, the mantle melt is saturated in these emissible sulfides, that'll effectively cap how much sulfur the milk can hold and will lower the sulfur dispersion values. And so you can see that purple curve here is able to reproduce the sulfur dispersion values at Lassen magmas fairly well. And so maybe we're onto something here. And another interesting uh, point to make about these models is that because in these models you're uh, sequestering all of this emissible sulfide phase, so all of this S2 minus, it actually has an effect on the overall uh, electron balance of the model. Because you're always taking out this S2 minus, those sulfides become an electron sink and effectively oxidize the melt as it ascends through the mantle wedge. And so even though this model has slightly less sulfur in it than the high slab S case, um, it's still able to reproduce the most oxidized cinder cones. So these three models in themselves are pretty interesting and the high slab uh, S with sulfides case, that purple curve, seems to be able to reproduce uh, loss and magma compositions pretty well. Um, however, there's still a lot that we don't know about how sulfides are transported um, during mantle melting. And I think it, it, it merits further study in thinking about all of the possibilities that could generate the compositions that we see at the surface. And so 
For the next two models, I'm going to think a little bit about what the initial mantle might have looked like. So does the initial mantle source before the influence of any slab derived sulfate um, have a large effect on the magma oxidation states that we see at the surface? So to think about this, I made uh, two kind of very simplified end member models to, as a basis for comparison. The first model that I created is to think about what would happen if the mantle source doesn't have any uh, sulfide in it before the influence of slab derived materials. So the reason why these kinds of uh, models might be relevant is that the Southern Cascades and Lassen Volcanic Field sits on top of this kind of hodgepodge of accreted terrains. And so there's good reason to think that the subarc mantle at Lassen has experienced prior metasomatism, prior melt extraction, um, and so might start out with a, uh, a different uh, overall sulfur budget and a different oxidation state than a typical morb source mantle. So uh, in this model, we make the simplifying assumption that all of the sulfide has been completely stripped uh, from the mantle prototype due to some prior melt extraction event. And if we do that, uh, we can see that we end up with uh, arc magmas that are more oxidized than our normal mantle case. And that's just because there's less sulfide in the mantle source originally. And so the uh, slab derived sulfate essentially doesn't have to work as hard uh, to generate elevated oxidation states in the mantle melts. So that all makes sense. Um, and we're able to reproduce some of the more reduced cinder cones, but we're still not able to reproduce the full spread of data. Furthermore, if we look at the lower right-hand uh, panel, again, we're really not doing a good job at all at reproducing the sulfur dispersing values. So it looks like, although uh, this kind of scenario may explain some of the complexity within the overall trend at Lassen, um, for example, uh, cinder cones like BRVB, which seem to deviate from the overall trend, um, a simplifying uh, assumption like this really can't explain uh, the diversity of uh, magma compositions that we see. If we instead ask, okay, well, what happens if the magma has already been completely oxidized? We're starting out with an oxidized mantle source. Um, so to simulate that kind of end member case, uh, we just ramped up the ferric iron content in our mantle source so that I could reproduce the most oxidized cinder cone at Lassen, which is BRM. So if we do that, um, we can obviously reproduce BRM because we chose our assumptions to make that happen, uh, but we seem to be missing the overall trend of uh, oxidation state as a function of strontium over neodymium at Lassen. And so uh, I think like sulfide extraction, prior mantle oxidation may play a key role in generating some of the variability that we see at Lassen, um, but it seems that uh, uh, like a simplified model of kind of some a uh, single stage prior oxidation event really can't reproduce what we see at the surface and, and seems to require um, a more complex scenario. So I think, uh, you know, drawing conclusions about these modeling efforts, what we can say is two things. Um, one is that slab derived sulfate can have a clear impact on the oxidation state of arc magmas, and I think that's a really valuable result in itself. Um, and by making a quantitative model like this, we're able to see clearly that in order to generate the magma oxidation state that we see at the surface, we need either a much higher uh, amount of slab, or excuse me, a much higher amount of sulfur in the slab drive uh, melt than is currently indicated by um, the available experiments, or we need some kind of more complicated multi-stage uh, model of mantle melting and mantle oxidation. So if you wanna think about what we learned at Lassen in the context of arc magmas globally, um, we can start out by comparing what we know about the oxidation state of uh, Lassen arc magmas to um, observations that have been made in other arcs. So here I'm plotting um, oxygen fugacity calculated for Lassen magmas and then comparing it to magmas in the Marianas arc. And what we can see is that the two arcs look pretty similar. And this is pretty interesting because again, the Cascades arc is a warm end member arc. Um, so very hot, young slab. And the Marianas in, in contrast is an island arc and it's a cold end member arc. And so the fact that the uh, oxygen fugacity of both arcs is very similar, strongly indicates that there's some kind of shared mechanism between the two arcs. 
And so uh, what I'd like to put forward as a uh, suggestion is that slabbed rice sulfur may be the common link between the oxidation state and arcs. And the reason why I think that's a reasonable idea to put forward is that the sulfur isotopes that we measure at Lassen are actually extremely similar to sulfur isotopes measured at arcs globally. So what I'm showing here is a, it's a Caltech plot of um, Lassen sulfur isotopes shown in that red box there uh, compared to morb sulfur isotopes shown in that gray line, that's the average morb composition. And for comparison, I plotted up a series of measured sulfur isotopes in volcanic gases, in arc magmas, and in intrusive rocks at arcs. And what's really fascinating about this plot is that they're all pretty similar. And um, I should add that these, these gases and these arc magmas, these are all taken from very different samples. So high temperature gases from a range of subduction zones and arc magmas that have all experienced variable degrees of degassing, crystallization. So if we look at this compilation together, it really seems to strongly suggest that um, the heavy sulfur isotope signal that we see at arcs uh, commonly is a function of source and not due to secondary processes like degassing and crystallization. And so I think this observation in conjunction with the similar oxidation state between arcs um, suggests that perhaps slab-derived sulfur and the source slab-derived sulfate in subduction zones can explain the common oxidation states that we see at arcs globally. So to wrap up, I've um, overlain the conceptual framework that I uh, laid out at the beginning of the talk, but I've added in some estimates for sulfur isotope cycling and for implications and observations of uh, sulfur speciation at arcs. So overall, I think there's three main conclusions to be drawn here. Um, one is that there are clear correlations between sulfur dispersium, strontium neodymium, sulfur isotopes and magma oxidation state at Lassen. And so this clearly uh, indicates that slab sulfur is in some way linked to the oxidation state of arc magmas. And so to think about whether that link is a causal link, I developed a series of mantle melting models um, and found that slab derived sulfate indeed does uh, oxidize arc magmas, but that doing so requires either a slab derived melt with a higher sulfur content than is uh, currently indicated by the limited experiments that are available, or it requires some kind of multi-stage model of oxidation. And uh, finally, I'll just put forward as a suggestion that the similar sulfur isotopes measured in arcs globally, and the similar oxygen fugacity observed in arcs globally, suggests that the mechanisms of sulfur transfer here and the magma oxidation mechanisms at Lassen can be applied to thinking about subduction zones around the world. So with that, I'll leave it open for questions. Uh, thanks so much for your time. And uh, yeah, happy to take any. Thank you, Michelle. That was uh, fascinating and uh, really, really clear, especially to a geophysicist. Um, thank you for that. Um, so uh, if you have questions, um, please uh, raise your hand in the participant box. Um, but I see that we have already a question from Longxian um, asking, saying arc magma is very oxidized. Um, so why can H2S be released during eruptions? Yeah, that's actually a, a pretty interesting question in itself. So there's two things going on. Um, one is that arc magmas overall are oxidized and are um, sulfate dominated, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the vapor phase in equilibrium with those magmas has to be also dominated by um, by oxidized sulfur. So things like the amount of water in the magma, uh, things like pressure and temperature, all affect the composition of that vapor phase. And so that's why you can see <clears throat> uh, volcanic gases that are H2S rich at arcs. Um, I'll also add that many of the uh, H2S rich gases that are observed at arcs uh, during gas monitoring expeditions, a lot of that's actually derived from hydrothermal systems and not from the primary magma. So this is the importance of, of going I, to the melt inclusion. Could I continue this question? Because from your slide, one time you show the, how to say, could you go back to your slide about yeah. the oxygen fugacity about H2S and, uh, and uh, sulfate? Let's see. Um, are you thinking of this slide? Oh, we can't uh, see the, oh, that one. Yeah, OK. Yeah, 
And uh, as you can see, so because uh, the or the arc uh, oxygen fugacity is around the new very near two, right? So in this case, uh, sulfide cannot exist, right? So if we in the magma, almost we have no S two minus. Then in this case, uh, even even in the gas, it's difficult to get H uh, two S, right? Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, I guess I should clarify this calibration curve is for, um, it's for the silicate melt, not for the vapor phase. So just because the silicate melt is saturated in sulfate doesn't necessarily mean that the vapor and, phase. And uh, one, one more question is, uh, does H2S and S2O in the, during eruption, is they are in the same generation or they se sequentially, or say, release the uh, gas? They are uh, released in different times or in the same time. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's actually, it's pretty interesting and it's a problem I've been thinking a little bit about. So uh, basically what happens at arcs is that uh, the gas phase is often H2S dominated at depth. And that has to do with the solubility um, and the uh, fugacity of uh, water at depth. Um, but then at low pressures, SO2 becomes the dominant phase as the overall volatile content of the magmas shift. So what so, that means is that during magma ascent, the gas phase shifts from an H2S dominated gas phase to an SO2 dominated gas phase. So if, they, if this is true, it means the oxidation occurs during the magma evolution, right? Not from the not from the starting material, right? So if oh, this sequential over time is true, right? Yeah, so sulfur degassing can drive changes in the overall magma oxidation state. And that's actually why it's so important that we selected relatively primitive olivine hosted melt inclusions for this study. So I'll go over to this slide. Um, so we thought really carefully about this because there have been observations that sulfur degassing can change the oxidation state of magmas. But in our data set, we intentionally chose um, olivine hosted melt inclusions that formed really early on during magma differentiation before any sulfur had partitioned into the gas phase. Um, and we uh, checked our, um, our natural data set for any signs of sulfur degassing and didn't see any. So that's why we're able to make these conclusions with a lot, a lot more confidence. So now the question is, uh, uh, which mechanism is dominant, right? So if the phases in the vapor can change from H2S to SO2, it means the oxygen fugacity changes from zero to two of delta QFM, right? So, so this uh, is a uh, major change of the fugacity, right? So can I might just interject and, and maybe suggest that um, you, can, you can chat in the uh, open chat afterwards, because I see we, um, we have other questions. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, it's okay. So, so, so please stick around and, and this sounds like a fascinating conversation. Um, so, so please continue it afterwards. Um, Connell, I see that you have your hand raised. Uh, yes, I have a couple of quick questions. Um, one is that uh, the BRVB is uh, often not lying on what otherwise look like very nice trends. And I was wondering, is that just, it's degassed or is there something else going on? My second question is that I think you were saying your best fit to the data required a lot of sulfide to be um, removed prior to eruption. And that must have some implications for uh, chalcophile element abundances in the melt. Uh, um, would, the, would you be able to use chalcophile elements to actually try and test whether the, there has been loss of sulfide from the melt? Yeah, I can definitely answer this question. So uh, in regards to BRVB, um, it's definitely a pretty interesting syndicone. I'll uh, go over to the slide here for reference. So yeah, BRVB definitely deviates from the overall trend. And I think this is a situation where um, some kind of mental heterogeneity may be playing a role. At BRVB, we don't see any sign, strong signs for sulfur degassing. And so um, I think it might be a mantle source signal um, in general, in Lassen and in other areas around uh, the Southern Cascades, there are indications from things like oxygen isotopes that the mantle is pretty heterogeneous. And so I don't think it's unreasonable to think that uh, BRVB may be affected by either uh, prior sulfide extraction or prior mantle oxidation. 
but it is it is a curious new kind of does deviate from the overall trend yeah yeah uh, I, I sort of always worry about appeals to mental heterogeneity the sort of get out of jail free card isn't it really uh it's one that's very hard to test but uh, it, obviously there is mental heterogeneity so yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, and, and you know, that's the trouble with continental arcs is that the subarch mantle can be a bit of a hodgepodge. Um, but I think BRVB, along with the general modeling efforts, um, it does indicate that we have a lot more to learn about what the subarch mantle looks like beneath arcs in regards to, to mantle oxidation state and sulfur content. Yeah, so I think it's an interesting question. So, so the other part of my question was, I think your best fit model has a lot of sulfide loss at some point. And yeah. Uh, you, that yeah. can take out most of your chalcophile elements, and I was just wondering if you've thought about looking at uh, chalcophile element abundances uh, in these in your melt melt inclusions. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I, I think that's a really exciting um, question, and I actually have a whole suite of chalcophile element measurements for these same melt inclusions. And from looking at that data so far, a lot of it's consistent with a sulfide saturated mantle melt. So. Stay tuned for those results to come out, but the, the chocolate file elements are consistent with that. Okay, good. That's exciting. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you, you kind of mentioned as, as an aside that there's very limited um, experimental work um, on uh, the behavior of sulfur in melts. And I'm, I guess I'm just curious why that is. Is it a, a difficult experiment to set up or what, um, you know, what it, maybe two parts is why is there such limited experimental work and what would be the most important experimental work to do next for your problems? Yeah, I think so. Um, a big reason why the, the experimental data set is pretty sparse is because um, these experiments are pretty difficult. Um, one challenge is that uh, sulfur likes to partition into a lot of experimental capsule materials. And so doing any experiment with sulfur is a little bit difficult. Um, but then to think about sulfur speciation, um, you also need to be pretty creative in thinking about how um, you're buffering oxygen fugacity. And so for that reason, uh, a lot of these experiments are pretty limited. I'd say um, one of the most important uncertainties right now is on the effect of this relationship. Um, so right now, uh, there's a few different models of sulfur speciation available um, and they all, uh, seem to suggest different uh, things about the effect of pressure, temperature, and composition. Um, and so I'd say if there was one, one area where I wish there was more experimental data, this is definitely it. And I think in terms of extrapolating things we see at the surface to what's happening at depth, this is definitely a limiting factor. All right, so experimentalists take note. Um, okay. Uh... I don't see any more raised hands. Um, so I think at this point we will conclude and thank Michelle again for a, a really fantastic talk and uh, question and answer afterwards. Um, postdocs, please, it sounds like there's uh, some interesting discussion that's gonna happen. So um, please stick around um, and talk with Michelle. Um, and uh, thank you again, Michelle. Thank you, everybody. Uh, rem remember, uh, two weeks will be the final uh, se seminar in this series. So uh, stay safe and happy and healthy. Happy Thanksgiving. And uh, we'll see you all back here in two weeks. All right. Thank you, everybody. That was cool. <laughs>